Okay, so it shows that we're oh, yeah. live. You're not well, so. Sorry, Let me see. <laughs> lunch is over here. I've got a vegan lunch for you. Okay. Start heavy by starting. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think we're. I think we're live. It works. Now I'm going to check Facebook as well because we're on Facebook too. Yeah, so we're broadcasting into different spots. I just want to make sure it works. And then also, I think we should turn our phones on sound. Yeah, if you don't mind. Okay, so I think we're live. Uh, so if you're joining us, live please comment and say hi i um we scheduled this amazing uh sauerkraut event with my friend uh sue peterson who invited me to share my knowledge with uh, some of her friends here so if you can all say hi, hi. <laughs> hi. See, we are all let me actually maybe try to move it and show a few people it's here yay so there are some people here and some people here We'll be making sauerkraut. And um, so we'll just start not to waste our time. Okay, thank you so, so much. Raina, thank you very much. We are so excited to <laughs> have you here. You're the best of the best, and we're all thank ready. You. <laughs> thank you. So um, uh, why we're doing this? Well, first of all, she invited me, which was very kind of her. But second, why I agreed, because June is a month of microbiome. And on June 27th, we will celebrate uh, the World Microbiome Day. And um, sauerkraut actually is one of the foods that can help us maintain a healthy microbiome. Do you know what microbiome is? Microbiome is... Um, all the bacteria, all the microorganisms, not only bacteria, that live in us and on us. Most of them are in the gut. And I'm sure you've heard about leaky guts and maybe microflora, the term. And um, you've heard about how yogurts are good for you. So yogurt is also one of the fermented foods. But today we're going to uh, do sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is actually uh, the staple food that I grew up with. All Eastern European eat sauerkraut, and this actually the one that we are going to make today is um, pretty much the same that I grew up with. Um, we'll need two main ingredients: is um, cabbage and carrot. Ideally, you want to have them organic or grown in your own garden if you can. If you can, just maybe go to a farmer's market or buy organic at the store. Um, uh, we will also need some sort of a cutting board. Actually, I'm going to move this to show what we need. A knife, right? Some sort of knife. Uh, the sharper, the better. Or you can have a shredder like that. I do love Warner. It's one of the best works great for cabbage. So I'm going to be using this today. Um, you um, may also need... Um, a shredder for um, for your carrot. I'm going to again use Borner, but you can use this one. We will need salt. Okay. Uh, and you want to choose sea salt. So it has to be pure sea salt with no additives. I really love this Celtic salt or French Mediterranean sea salt from Mediterranean Sea. Or you can just use a regular... Um, sea salt you know just read the ingredients make sure there are no uh other ingredients anti-cocking or whatever sometimes they add not not kosher salt just sea salt you may uh want to use also packer but um you don't have to you can use a spoon or your fingers hands that's how sauerkraut is made to kind of pack sauerkraut but i'll show you how to use that uh, you will also need a bowl where you will be mixing uh, your ingredients with salt. And you need some sort of jar for um, actually fermenting. So I like jars with a wide uh, neck. Is that how we mouth. call it? Mouth, mouth. mouth. Yes. Um, yes. And I often use these lids. They're special lids for fermenting, but they, you, you don't have 
special with for fermenting. My grandma didn't have those. Mm -hmm. uh, we just use regular buckets and uh, pots and whatever, you know, whatever could feed our cabbage. And we actually did in large volumes rather than today we will do a mini version. But actually last night I, I made some from just this one head of cabbage. And this is how it's going to look in the end. Okay. Uh, um, yes. And what else? We also need some weights. So uh, because I'm using this wide uh, amount uh, jars, you can actually, you don't have to, but you can uh, get those uh, glass weights. That's also kind of new generation invention. We didn't have those before, but this definitely helps to kind of create pressure on the south crowd. And when we get to the point where we need to use them, I'll explain more about it. So um, first things first, you need your vegetables clean and, and uh, you have yours clean already. I need to clean mine. So um, sometimes the first leaves can be can be kind of yucky. So if they're yucky, you just strip them off and compost or throw away. And carrots. So carrots, I don't peel them actually because you will peel off all the good bacteria from the carrots. So what I like to do, I like using this Norwex um, vegetable cloth and you can see I kind of cleaned part of it already and you can see how clean it is here and how dirty it is here. Show you as well. So you just scrub it a little bit and, um, and it cleans it really, really well. Okay. So, and I'm going to leave this leaves because it's easy to hold the carrot. So next time you do it, make sure buy the one with the leaves because, especially if you're using a slicer like me. Okay, so let's do the cabbage first. Uh, so you cut the cabbage. So you have half of the heads. I have the whole head. I recommend to cut it into quarters because that way it will be easier to cut. Oh, also, I forgot to mention that we need to have scales to weigh our cabbage. Um, because we need to add a certain amount of salt, right? We, we need to know exactly how much our cabbage weighs. And with, with a carrot, ideally. Okay. So it's about... 800 grams my cabbage yours a half half the half the amount and um the reason we we are weighing is we need to calculate how much salt we need so when we have a kilogram or two pounds of cabbage it's uh, recommended to you and to use about 20 grams of salt 20 grams of salt and also it's important actually to weigh the salt as well because measuring spoons, different salts have different um, sizes, like grain sizes, and so they will weigh, if you measure this tablespoon, you can get different numbers. So to have 20 grams, you need to use scales. So ideally, um, to be consistent and to kind of, for example, if your sauerkraut works really well, I mean, you like the taste and everything, so to repeat it again, you need exactly to put exactly the same amount of salt. So for my amount of salt, I will use 10 grams of um, 10 grams of salt. Um, you have about one teaspoon, which is about five grams of salt because you have half the amount of cabbage. Okay, so we'll start. Those who are watching us online, uh, you can uh, write down your comments and questions and I can answer those later. Okay, so uh, I love this thing, and uh, I usually like to slice my cabbage very thinly. That actually can speed up the process as well. The thinner you cut, the sooner it, it easier will be for microbes to ferment it. Uh, you can use knife, 
it's easy to do with knife as well. Have you ever cut the shredded the cabbage? So uh, if you're using knife, you just kind of um, let me. You put it on your cutting board and just cut it very thinly. And you see, you have. That's why I'm I'm talking about the sharp knife, right? Because the sharper it is, the thinner you will be able to cut it. But it doesn't matter. Some people cut it very thick. So it doesn't really matter how, how you're going to cut it. For example, I have a recipe for Georgian uh, sauerkraut. And they cut like in chunks. And they chunks. ferment it in chunks. So it's okay as well. It's going to just take you longer to ferment it. But with this kind of shredder, it's very easy. This is the fun part. <laughs> you know, actually, in, in villages back in the days, like 100 years ago, women would gather in, in villages and Ukraine and Russia and Lithuania. And after they harvest all the cabbage, they will get together and start making sauerkraut like we're, to do, like we're doing today. <laughs> so cute. Okay, so um, make sure leave this part, this um, you know, the centerpiece of the um, of the cabbage. It's very hard, and it's not as tasty as the rest of the cabbage. So we just leave it. Yeah, we don't use that part. Wow, you're fast! Look at you, faster than me. Super chopper. So here I have already one quarter shredded. And I'm going to shred the rest. Okay, so when I'm shredding like this, I sometimes have leaves falling off. I don't throw them away. I can use knife and just chop them. I don't like wasting. Okay. Yes, you can. Actually, um, so I was going to talk about that part when we get to the carrot. I do like to add different ingredients. And that's why I like this classic, our classic sauerkraut, because usually sauerkraut is just made with cabbage if you, if you go to the store, right? Most of them is just with cabbage. Um, so by adding carrot, you kind of add a little bit more flavor. It's a little bit more sweet. Um, and also you get more polyphenols, you just get more benefits from it. And, um, another recipe that I have also on my blog is actually where I mix two cabbages, white and red, and it's also a very nice combination. And again, because there are two different kinds of cabbages, it's red, so it has other, uh, chemicals in it that are very healthy for us. They're called phytonutrients <laughs> and um yeah so i love using red cabbage as well you can also add dill or garlic or onions whatever you like really you can make your own just use your <laughs> imagination what's your favorite combination my favorite you know, it, it depends on my mood. <laughs> I have several different sauerkrauts in my refrigerator. So if I am for the mood, 
for the beets, I also like to add beets in my uh, sauerkraut. I make Georgian. Um, I classify kimchi as a sort of sauerkraut too. So sometimes I'm in the mood for kimchi. So it depends. But this is the one that I knew for all my life. That's why today, and it's so simple to make compared to many others. After you make it, how long does it ferment for? So we'll get to that part. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm done with my cabbage. How about everyone else? Yeah? Okay, so uh, I'll need this bowl, so I'm transferring my cabbage in here. And the next step, what we're going to do, we will add some salt to our cabbage. So before we start shredding carrots, that way we'll save some, some time, uh, we'll add the salt. So I had about, I don't remember, about 600 or 700 uh, grams of cabbage, and I'm adding 10 grams of um, about two spoons, two teaspoons of salt. So we're adding it into our cabbage, and then we're mixing it. We just try to mix it really well. So salt will help um, to release the juices from the cabbage. And that's going to be our brine. So the more brine we have, the better. And this, this cabbage is really good. So, I mean, I can see that it's juicy, so we should have a lot of juice there. Okay, so when it's mixed more or less evenly, we just set it aside. We set it aside and we move to our carrots. Or carrot. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to change the the setting on my burner. And yeah, you, you just mix it. it. We will massage a little bit our cabbage later. Right now we just want to mix it and let it stay here. Um, and we can shred. You can actually shred in the same bowl so that you don't, yeah, you can, you can use the same bowl and shred it right there if it's convenient. Okay, so um, someone, oh, Jeanette is here joining us online. Jeanette is hi, saying hi to Sue and Karina and she's asking how much salt. So uh, ladies are using half a head of the, um, of the sauerkraut. They're using around three to 400 uh, grams of uh, sauerkraut and they're using one teaspoon, five grams of uh, salt. I'm using double of the amount, uh, so I'm using twice as much cabbage, so I'm using twice as much salt. I'm using 10 grams. Can you see how fun? We're doing a hybrid here, live and virtual, amazing, I love it. Okay, so I'm done, how about you? See what I'm talking about with this shredder? It's very, very, because otherwise you cut your fingers all the time, or, or nails, it's horrible. So, yeah, so I usually, by the way, uh, these leaves you can save, you can dry them out and use for the soup when you make soup. It's great for the, for the broth or just compost, whatever. But I save those. Yeah. Okay, so our uh, carrots are done. You can see how finely also they're shredded. So I'm adding them back to my cabbage. And my cabbage is already wet. What about yours? I can I can see how how, how sweaty it is, right? It's sweating. So we mix the carrots together with our cabbage.
and we kind of can put a little bit pressure on our cabbage to uh, so that it it sweats even more i love that turn sweating that's why it's sweating you got it sorry i had to take a break <laughs> i missed the salt Oh, you missed the salt. That's probably the that's, most the most that's the most important part. That's the, <laughs> that's the most important right part. There. Yes. So salt is very important. It's our, basically, it's our guarantee that there won't be any other bad bacteria growing in our sauerkraut. So, um, yeah. So I'll just remind for everyone that it's 20 grams per one kilogram of cabbage or about two pounds. Um 20 grams. I'm actually using a little bit less. I just don't like it very salty. But if you start, I recommend to start with 20 because the more salt you have, the more likely it will work. And the less salt you have, uh, there is more risk that someone else, some other microorganisms will start growing. So, okay. So you see how, how wet it is? It's shiny wet. So now it's pretty much ready. If you feel like there is enough juice where you, when you press on it and you see some juice in your bowl, uh, then, or brine, uh, then you can start packing into your jar. We're pretty much oh, done, ladies. Nice. So uh, just don't um, do it very quickly. Try to kind of put it slowly inside so that it doesn't fall all around. That's what usually happens to me. I end up, sorry, Sua. <laughs> we will end up with cabbage all over the place. So, and here comes the packer. So the packer is very convenient. It's the best, perfect size. Packer, yeah. I think that's how you call it in, in English. And you kind of pack it. So we kind of push the air out. I hope you can see as well you push the air out and uh, and then add more cabbage and then pack again so in the end we want to have so much brine that it covers our cabbage so we, we want we want our cabbage to be submerged in the brine it's very very important um, if it's not submerged it can start boiling so yeah everything is uh, that is under the surface of the brine is basically a great uh, environment for lactic acid bacteria to grow if um, it's not covered it'll it'll go bad very quickly so this is very important that's why it's important to important to pack and that's why it's important to put some weights on your cabbage as well you see i'm already yeah, I yeah? you see the juice and the more you pack it's like with grapes you know how they do the wine and they <laughs> press the wine and walk on on, on the on the grapes mm -hmm. so they're releasing the juice so basically we're doing the same with cabbage we're releasing all the juice And these jars, as you can see, are perfect for like one head of cabbage. But I can tell you honestly, I'm usually doing three heads of cabbage because it's still some time to make it, right? So why not do more? Because you can store this cabbage for up to one year in the refrigerator. Yeah, you can make... That's how people used to do they we used to grow cabbage can, can then ferment it, it and then it will last till the next season can you do it without packing it or not um i so you can you use make sure it's all covered I yeah you uh you, so you ideally you want to pack it you can use some sort of spoon or Oh yeah, she's finding some tools. Finding you, you can you can use spoons. So if the neck was a little bit wider, you could use your hand. That's how my that's how we did it back in the days. Yeah, you can do 
Or, for example, if your cabbage is just not having a good day and doesn't have a lot of juice in it, you can prepare some brine. But that's kind of a different method. So today we're going to try to... Um, it's it's gonna get there, you know. Okay. Uh, if it's thicker, if you cut it a little bit thicker than I did, uh, mm -hmm. it's gonna take a little bit longer for it, for it to release juice. And sometimes, actually, I leave my uh, cabbage in the bowl for about thirty minutes on the countertop. I'll cover it and let it sit. Mm -hmm. And in thirty minutes, when I come, I have so much juice. Mm -hmm. So you can just lit it like this, and um, you see how much, right? Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So there's, you're not adding vinegar. That's it. No, no, that's it. Cabbage is so during and you yeah the liquid inside the cabbage. So during fermentation, uh, there will be different bacteria growing at different stages. They will be releasing lactic acid and also acetic acid. So they will naturally. That was the natural way to pickle. You know. So yeah, there will be plenty of acid to preserve the cabbage. That's why you can store it for so long. So um, that's when um, those weights that I talked about come in. So uh, you just put on top of this cabbage weight and press. Usually one is not enough, but sometimes it is enough. I usually add two and then cover it with this cover. It doesn't have to be very, um, you know, tightly tightened. It can be loose. You can also use a cheesecloth on top of it. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. But if it's a plastic lid, it's okay. You know. Uh, and there are different systems, different ways. Uh, Germans they have um, clay structures. They seal their um, their containers so that no air can get in. But really, everything that is about the is below the brine is under anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic means without air. So as long as you cabbage covered with the brine, uh, these are the great and uh, perfect conditions for the fermentation to happen. So I leave this on countertop. So th I made this yesterday, and you can see the difference. So we have more brine here. So don't worry, you'll get more brine. Uh, closer to the evening and tomorrow. Uh, every day it will actually release more and more uh, juices from the cells. And I recommend to ferment it for, for about two weeks at least. Yes. So that's a fancy lid that you have on there. What is it? Does it vent or what, what is this? Yeah, actually, so uh, it can release gas. So, but I usually don't have problem with it, so I never even used. Uh, yeah. It comes with a pump, and you can uh, release gas from from this rubber pump. Also, if there's too much brine, it can go through it as well, which is good. Um, but. Yeah, usually I don't have any problems. What I have problems with, remembering what day I actually cut my cabbage. <laughs> so what I love about these leaves is that they have a scale here. And on this scale, you can you can pick a date. And that way you remember. So today is 13th. Uh, that way you remember that on the 13th, you uh, made sauerkraut. Like on 23rd, you can check. Well, actually, you, you, you should monitor it every day and make sure um, make sure it doesn't, you know, nothing else grows in there, okay? Uh, make sure it's covered with brine. So if you see that there is not enough juice, um, you can come home and maybe smoosh it even more, and that way it will release more brine. But if you see that there is not enough brine, then you can make some extra brine just mix water, filtered water with a salt, and pour a little bit. Or if you have kombucha, pour some kombucha on top. I love it. This will be, it's one of the crowds when I add some kombucha in it. So yeah, so that will be kind of also extra bacteria that are good bacteria and it, it, it will have, it has some vinegar in it because it does have some acetic acid as well in it. So, yeah, that would be probably the easiest. Just get a bottle of kombucha and pour some kombucha on top rather than messing with the brine. 
Okay, so that's that's our um, uh, that's our um, basically sauerkraut. That's it. We made it. And we actually have some that you that I brought from the house that you can try over there. So if you guys wanna try and and make some exclamation <laughs> noises, excite, exciting. You're so welcome. Yeah. So uh, about the weight. So if you have, if you don't have these weights also, but you have little jars maybe at home somewhere. You know how they have little jars. Yeah. <laughs> you like it? It's it's almost identical to what we're actually doing, but I added some cranberries in there. So um, yeah. So you see one of the ways to actually add some cranberries. It makes it even healthier for your microbiome. How are the yeah. cranberries prepared? Fresh and dropped in? So I buy a lot of cranberries in, in the fall and then freeze them. Oh. And then I use them for all sorts of things. And one of the things is uh, for sauerkraut. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jeanette is asking about the jellies and the weights. If you choose to, again, you don't have to. My grandma, my mom, when I started 10 years ago, I just used regular bowls and pots and whatever I had and cheesecloth, you know, things like that. You can do it. Um, but obviously, if you want to look nice and cool <laughs> and show off, <laughs> then you can, uh, you can buy these things as well. Did you say these go in the refrigerator? Or so right now, no, right now they will stay on the countertop somewhere uh, watch for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you watch it. Uh, you can start with a week and then remove the weights and, and try it. And you'll see in about a week. If you like it the way it is, you can start eating it. Um, if you want it to be more sour, you can um, leave it for another week. You know, just make sure you use clean utensils and everything so that you don't contaminate it. Mm -hmm. And when it's ready to your liking, you just put it in the refrigerator and you can keep it for as long as one year. But it's, uh, you know, that amount will probably go very fast. <laughs> Hopefully you will eat it right away. That's why I'm usually making more and just keep it in the refrigerator. Back in the days, um, my grandma, they used to have under the house, uh, you know, like extra additional rooms that were cold and they kept a lot of things in there. Or during winter, for example, our balcony, well, I'm from Lithuania, so we had freezing winters. So we often kept our sauerkraut on the, on the balcony where it's cooler than in the house. But um, we have to use the refrigerator, so we have to be um, mindful of the space, obviously, or get another refrigerator. <laughs> I have two, one for all the, uh, all the ferment fermented things. Okay, let's see, uh, let's see what are the questions. Okay, Lydia is asking about the glass weights. I mentioned that I will send an email to everyone who registered and I will uh, share the links to the, um, to the to the weights and uh um there are some longer comments that i i'm afraid i won't be able to read right now but i will come back to all those comments later on do you guys have any questions i do ladies if, yes if a little bit of something starts growing uh, can you just take it out yeah and, okay. yeah if Remove you if if it. you see that on hopefully nothing mm -hmm. will cool. so if yeah. it's in the brine it's less likely that something is gonna is gonna grow okay if uh if there is not enough brine you can if you want you can borrow my packer if you guys want and just Right yeah, right now, just, 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 yeah, just, oh, without a set. Oh, look, you see? Uh, so the packer is also, an, uh, I get everything from Amazon, and um, I, I will send the link for the packer as well. And you see, it's perfect. It's perfect for two sizes of the jars. Yeah, you just need a little women power you see, power. You see how there's uh, the carrots and stuff along yeah there. you you need to kind of 
need to make see. sure everything goes I down. See. Okay. Yeah, otherwise things can start growing. This is I food see. for okay. bad bacteria, right. basically. So uh, I, I'm Ukrainian. Oh. I grew up as a little girl doing this. Oh. My mom used to do also beets. We used to do the oh. shredded beets or yes. pickled beets. Yeah. Um, and we also use, um, once the sauerkraut is done, we also use it for the pepe, the pierogies. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can put it in pierogies, which looks oh, like an empanada. You yes. just put it in there. Yeah, yeah. Pierogi. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. call it pe pierogi. Pierogi. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We do the same. Just bring back memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm using it. You can, you can stew. You make stew yeah. with the uh, sauerkraut. You can make borscht. I'm yep. sure Ukrainian lots also, of yeah. lots of borscht with, um, with this is my, my, one of my favorite soups. Um, yeah. So you see it works. Yeah. Also make sure, um, that all your cabbage pieces and carrot pieces, uh, push down towards the end of the jar so that everything is covered. So the, the cleaner, the top part is the better, but you can also use the spoon and kind of help it. To, or a knife or something. Yeah. Okay. Vicky is asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So high in probiotics, which we need from gut health. Right. Uh, does this, for an average healthy person, I know that's loose, but <laughs> would this some, would this work to help our gut bacteria, where maybe we don't need probiotics if we um, take this. I mean, I eat a block every day. Wonderful. So two blocks. But. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. Actually, from my own experience, some of you know that I'm also okay. consulting and I'm uh, working one on one with people. They come with microbiome tests and I look at their microbial composition and their diversity. And unfortunately, what I see that um, our diversity is not as great anymore as it used to be and actually each generation uh the diversity microbial diversity of each generation goes down mm -hmm. because of the uh antibiotics other drugs that we're using um just lifestyle food so, habits western diet all those things um stuff on stuff um Fertilizers. Yes, everything. Well, everything foods, in combination. Uh, yeah, I'm herbicides, sorry. pesticides. Yes. So non GMO. Everything, yeah. everything in combination kind of lowers our diversity. So um, that's why I pretty much recommend every single client of mine use fermented foods. Not just one, and sometimes not just two, but more because every fermented food. Uh, will have their own unique microbial composition. Yeah. And by having different types of fermented foods, you'll basically get more uh, beneficial bacteria. You can share you, with yeah, some, if someone say, wants. Yeah. Like and um, yeah, uh, there are obviously certain bacteria like bifidobacteria that are unfortunately not present in most fermented foods. So we cannot, if someone is mixing bifidobacteria, they're not going to get them with fermented foods. But most of us, um, I'm missing lactobacillus, these are lactic acid bacteria, and that's what is in abundance in different fermented foods. Actually, one interesting fact, according to one of the latest research uh, on sauerkraut uh, during the last maybe five years, uh, some scientists became very interested in learning more about sauerkraut microbiome, and they found that certain sauerkrauts can have up to 400 different microbes, 400 different microbes. So if you look at the probiotic that you usually on a regular basis uh, use, you how many bacteria you will have there? Well, at most, maybe 20 or 30 different strains. Usually it could be one strain or two or five. Mm -hmm. And sauerkraut may have up to 400. There's no such probiotic on the market. Um, but of course it has to be done in a proper way. It has to be, all the ingredients have to be, um, of a high quality. You ideally you want to use salt of appropriate amount so that a non-beneficial bacteria don't grow there. And you have to ferment it, uh, for 
longer period of time. So the longer we ferment, the more lactic acid bacteria we get in our sauerkraut. Yeah, and uh, someone is asking here about kombucha again. I mentioned that, yes, you can actually add some kombucha if uh, you don't have enough brine, but I see that you already have quite a bit. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, so if you feel like you don't have enough brine, you can add a little bit of kombucha on top. And Can I add to that? Mm -hmm. So I see a functional medicine doctor. I'm actually on three antibiotics right now. I'm at the end of it, and I've had my microbiomes tested. And um, I have a histamine intolerance. Mm -hmm. So anything like kombucha or sauerkraut, tomatoes, I know what the histamine foods are that if I do too much of it, mm -hmm. it actually does the opposite for me and I get inflamed. Mm -hmm. So it's a, cause a lot of inflammation. And then I've also learned too, I'm in menopause now, but pre-menopause, my gut was able to handle that. Now I'm menopause, my gut can't handle it. Yeah. So I have to do it in very minimal i know mm -hmm. what the foods are so i was yeah. like what the heck what do you mean histamine intolerance yeah. and it causes me to uh swell up and, mm -hmm. and get inflamed yeah and being on antibiotics right now i am taking a probiotic but i have to take it two hours apart mm -hmm. from my medicine because also too being in menopause my gut is talking to my brain your gut and yes. your brain are connected yes. whatever mm -hmm. goes on here is going on in here exactly. and it changes in menopause yeah. Yeah. Um, and most of our intolerances are actually caused by um, by the altered microbiome. Yeah. So a lot of people think they're allergic or sensitive to gluten, dairy, or some histamine. Um, but they don't realize why it happens. It happens because. Um, Due to the altered microbiome, the cells become unhealthy in, in the gut. So we need those microbes to have our cells in a healthy shape. So if we are missing those bacteria, then our cells are not happy. And when they become unhappy, then the bonds between uh, the cells that are called tight junctions, they become very loose. And that's when you start having leaky gut. So the reason is actually because bacteria are missing. So mm -hmm. it's not really the fault of gluten or dairy, although sometimes it can be, right? If we're eating, you know, a bad quality bread or a lot of it, or if we're eating bad quality, drinking bad quality milk, you know, and things like that. So, um, so when you work on your microbiome, you restore the health of your cells, you reduce inflammation, and you get rid of the insensitivities, including histamine and gluten and dairy. A lot of my clients come to me and say, I cannot eat cheese. And then they start eating cheese, you know, when they uh, work on their microbiome. Mm -hmm. But um, it's nice to know what's inside before you can uh, actually find the best way how to fix it. So I hope this was helpful. And if there are more questions, I will answer them later. And I, it's been 43 minutes. You see, we were right on time, less than an hour. Amazing. Thank you so much to everyone who joined. And I hope now you can do your own, and no kombucha, mm -hmm. your, your own sauerkraut. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for watching. Yay.